Have you heard? Metro by T-Mobile now includes Amazon Prime. Yes, enjoy the best of shopping and entertainment, movies, TV shows, music, free shipping, and much more. All included for just $40 per line for three lines. All on the T-Mobile network. Discover the smarter way. Metro by T-Mobile. That's genius. One offer per account. Offer subject to change. $12.99 per month value. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Metro customers may notice reduced speeds versus some T-Mobile customers. Video at 480p. Capable device required. See store for details and terms and conditions. everyone and welcome to Aquarian Radio at AquarianRadio.com. I'm your host, Janet Carolison, with my co-host, John Polk, Reverend John Polk, and today is an episode of Experiencers Network. It is October 30th, 2015, and today we have special guests, Karen Christine Patrick and Brett Colin Shepard. And let's see, on this show, um, John, are you able to get the description of the show? Otherwise, I'll just read it for our listeners. Uh, I got it right here if you want me to share it with everybody. That way. On this, on this show, we discuss the two space programs, the secret space program and NASA, the upfront program. We also cover the work of Dr. Ralph Kennedy Johnston, otherwise more affectionately known as Ken Johnston, former NASA astronaut who worked on the LRL, the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, where he supervised receiving the moon rocks and photos from the Apollo missions. Brett and Karen are working with Dr. Johnston to produce two books, Ken's autobiography and a second book, which is a photo journal. Did we really go to the moon? What's really going on in space? What is the breakaway civilization and how does it work? There is so much information being revealed. It's like drinking out of a fire hose. How do we deal with it all and get a handle on it? How do we sort through all this information? Excellent. Karen, Christine, Patrick, are you there? I am here and glad to be talking to you in a different state of mind. We, my family, Brett and I, we and his daughter, we moved from Tex, Texarkana, Texas, and we're now living in New Mexico, not too far from Albuquerque. And Brett and I befriended uh, Dr. Johnston and have been working on helping him. He's got a huge archive and collection and a lot of information and great stories about the early years of Apollo missions. So we're here <laughs> to help him do this, this job and get more. He's done some re- revelation when he worked with um, Richard Hoagland, uh, and that was wonderful. And we're trying to help him get updates and even more information out to the public to know a bit more behind the scenes at our space agency, NASA. Well, John and I are going to rotate and ask you questions, but what would you like to say to our listeners about this project and what you're, what you're focused on right now? Well, um, Dr. Johnson is a little bit of the minority report out of the, generally speaking, most of the astronauts and most of the people that work for NASA in that he was working for the LRL, which is the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, and he was um, in charge of when the samples from the Apollo missions came in of white moon rocks and also the photos. And ostensibly the story is that one day he was walking through, you know, one of the the facility and saw some people uh, altering uh, photographs, which wasn't too unusual because they did use the NASA photographs for um, promotion, you know, for posters and stamps and books and whatnot. But the types of alterations that were being made were to smudge out on a, a few in, uh, uncomfortable uh, images that make might make people question, what's that, you know? 
Uh, so possibly uh, ancient bases or artifacts or ruins and lunar photographs. And another common thing that they did also was to blacken out the sky behind um, uh, the, uh, you know, you see the horizon line of the moon and then the sky wouldn't have any stars in it. And this is one of the questions that comes up over and over. How come we can't see any stars? And the person who was doing the blackening out said, well, the stars would confuse people, which is kind of funny because we see them every night. I'm not sure how confused we are about stars. But but there was uncomfortable things in the background as well as they did the black and out process to create a false horizon. So you might be looking down in a crater, but they made it look like you were looking up. And so by creating a false horizon, they could get rid of, you know, uncomfortable stuff or alter the picture. And um, <clears throat> so that's where what he came out with in 1996 in a press conference. Uh, that had Richard Hoagland himself and actually six other uh, scientists and other people who knew about this stuff who were, you know, kind of calling NASA out, what's going on here? Because NASA was, it's an interesting entity all of itself that we can talk about, but it was, uh, you know, ostensibly our space program. We, we, we have given over all of our inquiry about space to NASA. And over the years, especially on the Internet, it's, so much information has come out that calls a lot of people into question is what what's going on here? What are they hiding? How come the some of the data is contradictory? Um, there's really a lot of questions there. So Brett and I have Brett's been working uh organized the Lunar Anomaly Research Society. He's been looking at lunar images for years. I came in with them to work on some research as the background of our space program and whatnot. And we befriended uh, Dr. Johnston and moved here to assist and help with his enormous amount of information to try to get it out, especially in new mediums like online and ebooks and printed books and that whatnot. That's what we're kind of here to do. So it's overwhelming because <laughs> there's really a lot. And um, it's very exciting to see these things with your own eye. For instance, if you're looking at a scanned image of one of these images and there's a piece of dust on it, you might think, oh, wow, there's a spaceship. It's probably a piece of dust. Whereas you look at the photo, you can clearly see is it, you know, a piece of dust or is it something interesting to, to look at more, you know, carefully. So anyway, we're we're kind of not just quite out of boxes from moving, you know, just the kind of that, you know, trying to figure out where things go, stage of moving. And on top of that, we're immersed in this information, and it's a super exciting time for us, and we really want to share that with um, with the world and with anybody interested in our space agency history. Yeah, I have a question for Karen. Um, I do. Um, so Ken Johnson, he worked for NASA for 23 years on space programs, and training the astronauts. Um, he was one of five pilots who tested Apollo, including the lunar module, which ultimately carried Neil and Buzz to the moon. And he was also a trainer. Can you go into more detail about what astronauts he trained on what equipment and what spacecraft? Well, one of the things to know is I'm working on his autobiography, so I've been very excited to see how much involvement that he had with NASA. He's been written off by some skeptics as just being a contractor. And I want to clarify that as everyone pretty much was a contractor. NASA did a very large project, pretty much like military industrial complex type projects go, and they didn't necessarily always directly hire. They hired through organizations. And he was organiza he was uh, hired through a couple of organizations depending on what part of his career the first part of his career, he was uh, he was actually helping them refine uh, the spacesuits. You know how to get in in and out of them, how to use them for you know bodily function issues, how to use the gloves to ma manipulate equipment because they had these big, thick, heavy gloves, and so there was a lot of testing that was involved. And, and he happened to be the right size. I think I, I can't remember if he said he was a body double size for uh, Buzz Aldrin or. Neil Armstrong, I forgot, it might have been Neil Armstrong, but he actually was the same measurement, so they could actually see how that was going to work for an astronaut that was actually going to go. Um, I'm hoping to get more details about other types of equipment. Um, the, the more, you know, some people say we we didn't go to the moon, and, and I want to speak to that with the idea that um, someone told me once, 
that the Philadelphia experiment, which was where they cloaked a battleship, uh, that the Navy actually sent out 1,000 different versions of the story out to, they leaked, so to speak, 1,000 different versions of the story. And that seems to be a common thing that they do with projects that they want details not to be known by. And, of course, in the early years of NASA, we were in the space race with the Russians, and so everything was hush, hush, top secret. So um, one of the things that when we look at our our um, c- commitment and the activities going towards the moon, I have a term that I use, and I call it a complexity. So it's the same reason why we're able to keep the research and development of the atom bomb secret in, in spite of so many people working out on it. Uh, and other, the black ops type programs like the Philadelphia Experiment, ditto with uh, the NASA program to go to the moon, is that there's a lot of different stories out there. So I'm just going to talk about, uh, you know, what I'm able to center on now and work with is what Dr. Johnston's telling us from his personal human experience. I can't speak to every aspect. But he was doing significant work with the testing and also with um, they had pressurized um, you know large uh, uh, containers where they uh, tested equipment in a vacuum situation and that allowed them to um, you know simulate what the moon would be like with the lunar orbiter um, module and also the lunar lander and so they were you know working so he showed us a book that had signature after signature after signature of um, NASA astronauts going all the way through the, from the Apollo program all the way through to the shuttle program, as a matter of fact, because that was one of the, the big jobs that he did was to work with the um, equipment in the bag, vacuum chambers that they did. So um, so we ha- so that makes it difficult to sort out, you know, like, who's, you know, we have a lot of doubt now about did we actually go to the moon and all that sort of thing. And I don't want to completely wipe that out because of the fact that it's okay to ask questions. It's, it, you need to be polite right. about it, but it's okay to question. We should question. This was paid for by the American people, by the taxpayers. It's okay to, to get all this out on the table as a country and a, a, as the world and figure out what's the truth and what isn't it. I don't think it's anything wrong. Let's just look at all the evidence. Look at the evidence of the people who worked there. Uh, I think he said that when the men were landing on the moon, right at the same time they laid off 30,000 subcontractors and employees because they had already done the research and development. Now they were doing the mission. So these are a lot of unsung you know, people, you can imagine just sewing a spacesuit. It had to be seven later layers, and they all had to be stitched, and it couldn't have any air leak out of it. I mean, that's just a spacesuit, let alone the equipment that they took, um, the crafts themselves, all of that was very complex. So I don't want to, like, write it off that nothing happened. Um, or it could have also been, you know, that we have disinformation in that 1,000 different story, you know, thing to kind of throw people off. It's time, and I hear this from so many whistleblowers, it's time for us to have those discussions and for that information to come out and for us to know what our real history is, even if it's not quite what we thought. So it's an interesting position that Rhett and I find ourselves is to, to get kind of locked down one uh, with one person and walk through their human experience of what they experienced. And so with Ken, it's, he's um, a fighter pilot in the Marines, and then he was working with uh, NASA on the fighter, you know, it, uh, not the, excuse me, the um, equipment issues for the everything from the, the craft itself to the uniforms to another part of his um, career was involved in the, um, the lunar uh, uh, reconnaissance, excuse me, the lunar, receiving lab where we're getting the material now back from the moon. And so there's multiple facets of his involvement, and he wasn't just a contractor, like just some guy watching or something. He was very, very involved, as were a lot of people. And I really wish in those intervening years more of them had come forth with more information, but it was a military operation, and so we we don't necessarily have been uh, privy to all the information that was available. So, you know, we want to know our history before most of these guys are gone. So <laughs> that's kind of one impetus for people to tell their story. 
I understand that you've been researching a little bit. Uh, we we had uh, listeners. We had Karen. Of course, you know Karen was, or was, or is, or will be back as one of our co-hosts on the Korean Radio Network, and she's been on the hiatus because she's been moving. And um, during the recess here, Karen said that you said to me earlier today that you were researching what Corey Good's work on Mars and. There's a couple whistleblowers out now that are saying, uh, we interviewed Randy Kramer a couple weeks ago on our Revolution Radio, The Sacred Matrix, on Sunday. What? Tell us a little bit, and both of you can chime in, but what have you learned about the Secret Space Program? And what do you remember to tell our listeners? Wow. Well, to me, this goes back to Werner von Braun. You know, back during Operation Paperclip after World War II, um, we, you know, we brought all over the Nazi scientists and uh, Hermann Oberth and Werner von Braun admitted, and I'm going to just go out on a limb here, but admitted to our government and to NASA that they had open communication with ETs that taught them not just how to retro engineer a craft, but how to build one. And right around that time was d which was a time machine. So what I believe is that that is the core and the root of the secret space program, that that technology was brought over here. And as that we all know, the Apollo missions were really a front for what they were doing behind the scenes. And I live close to Kennedy Space Center. I live about an hour away. And it is not unusual at all to see a rocket go up in the sky and there's no mention of it. There's no mention of it on the news. There's no uh, news coverage of it on television. And I've been, you know, I'm an entertainer in the Orlando area, and it's not unusual to be at a resort out by Disney and just look up at the sky, and you can see something that's clearly not a commercial aircraft, and it's going straight up, you know, 250 miles up in outer space. And I've a number of times I have mentioned, you know, hey, folks, look, is that, does that look like any airplane you've ever seen before? I said, you know, a couple of times I said, you know, they don't always publicize these launches. So it, it's kind of curious what's going on. And then certain days, you know, Kennedy Space Center is a massive tourist attraction, but certain days it's just not open. And I believe it's during some of these times they're launching esoteric craft that they just don't want us to know about. And I, once again, it goes back to Werner von Braun being the, the king of the American space age. You know, our rocket program in the United States was basically a German rocket program. And it all started from that crash in the Black Forest in Poland back in 1937, where the Nazi Anunnaki Society went and found that craft, brought it back to uh, Nazi Germany, and there was actually ETs on board that lived, and one or two of which survived and were able to work with the German scientists to build D Glock, which was a time machine and other aircraft as well. I had heard about that story of fr- story from um an author, his last name is Quicken Doyle, and he uh was conveying the history from his research and he's mm-hmm. African American, he says a lot of the things come down through his community and they just kinda stop there and so he was coming forth as a whistleblower with some secret information that came down through his community, which included that information that you just talked about. Karen, what do you know about the Secret Space Program? Are you there, Karen? Did we lose you? Okay. Now she's... Hello. Okay, there you go. Uh-huh. You got clicked off. Are you okay, Karen? I, I, found, I found the trap door in the floor and came back through, so here we are. Um, yeah, no, um, I know I was listening to what you guys were talking about. I, you hit it the core issue is that there are two stories here. There's two space uh, efforts. One is the, and, and I want to make get people to learn this term I learned, the consensus reality, which is we all agree this is what happened. And then I want to add one word, consensus reality show. And the reason why that's a, a, a I wrote a poem about it, not as, if I was clever, Pun, but it, it makes sense is that we have our mainstream media, our our politics, our culture, 
is a show because almost everything that we know about space, about our, you know, uh, science, the way that we think of it, it is media driven. You know, it's media driven. And, and I remember when the men were landing on the moon, I was about seven years old and I would run in to see them on the television, the little guys bouncing around on the moon. And then I'd run out to where the moon was at and look up and, and try to see it. And I kept bothering my dad. Hey, let's get our telescope out so we can see the guys. And, he, you know, he was saying, well, they're too small. And so I, you know, I couldn't figure that out right away as a little kid. But that's, that's it. The only way we saw all of this was on television with the Walter right. Cronkite thing. And that's the way it is, you know. Um, and so we have a whole back history uh, that you were talking about, John, of um, that there was two the, the two realities, the consensus reality show and what's going on behind the scenes starts out with one major thing. What is your base science? Because your base science, your particle theory, materialistic, you know, Einstein, Newtonian, Newton, excuse me, Newton, um, Science is particle-based, sort of kind of. I'm generalizing, and I know physics people are about ready to hit me with a, a, a tomato. But um, And then there's energy-based. The, and that was with the real society. Um, we're um, tapping into um, ET, just coaching them on how to tap into the real energy or the zero-point energy or, you know, that sort of thing. And the craft that comes out of that, you know, one looks like a... A, you know, like a, a obelisk, you know, shall we say it, penis shaped, you know, it's like a rocket, right? And then the other basic shape you get when you use the energetics is you get a disc shape because it, it's fitting the way that the uh, energy forms around those kind of crafts, that's toroidal energy. And so you have totally two different bases for how are we going to get off this earth and go somewhere. So basically, um, if we... One other aspect of these two different energies is um, if you run off the normal energy we normally think about uh, that we've been doing since caveman days is burning something, right? You know, burning logs and to keep our cave warm and burning fuel to, to go up into space. Whereas the other energy base is c- totally different. Well, they didn't, we've been running, we've had corporations and, and families and bankers and everything benefiting off the fact that we think we have to burn something. So we put gas in our cars, and that's how we get around. And they, they are not about to upset their apple cart of their uh, finances. So they say, okay, we have a craft. We want to take to space. Obviously, we have to burn something. So they burn rocket fuel. So the basis of the technology for the uh, the other secret program is not based on that. It's based on uh on subtle energy and zero point and the stuff that Tesla was trying to encourage us to use. So that's kind of why there's two different things going on. Now we've They've done a very good job keeping us from knowing um, about this, the breakaway civ- civilization, as Richard Dolan calls it, um, the secret space program. I don't know if people know there's a secret space program conference that was uh, in Austin, I think, the last time, and before that, San Mateo, and if you Google secret space program conference, you'll hear some very interesting um, talks about, you know, what is this, as well as all the information coming out from Corey Good and Andy Kramer and all that, saying that way back in the day, probably uh, when, like you just said, it's spot on, John, um, one part of humanity went in the direction of the subtle energy for their basis for a space program. And now we have two civilizations. We have a very primitive civilization that burns fuel and is still on the planet. And we have another part of us, a part of humanity, that is utilizing this other technology, and they're up in space. And and that is an interesting conundrum by itself for humanity and and all. Like, are they going to be allowed to just do that? (laughs) Like, what happens to us, you know, that are stuck on the ground? I mean, philosophically, it's, a very interesting question to be signed to just understanding the technology base. I had Dr. Michael Sala on our uh, radio, uh, Revolution Radio Sacred Matrix on, let's see, it was July 5th, and he had interviewed Corey Good extensively, and he was a, he had mastered the information pretty much, and he said there were five different space programs. 
One was called the Solar Warden Program, started in the 50s by the U.S. military, and it was a program that provided military protect, protection. Uh, apparently, there is a warlike faction in space that periodically may attack us. There was one that was a, a mining project called kind of an interplanetary corporate conglomerate, and they were into commerce. They were kind of like the Ferengi in Star Trek. Another one was the Dark Fleet. It was Nazi Germany-based. Um, let's see, it was the Aldebarans and the Vril Society, and it was uh, about psychic power, and it had, that was the very first space program. And even within the Dark Fleet and the Nazi Germany faction, there were two programs, uh, the Burrell Society and the Nazi, Nazi SS war effort. And there, that was a weaponized space program. Then there's a, a NATO-type alliance run by the Europeans, and they get hand-me-down space technology and uh, that was France, Germany, Italy, Russia. There was another one, a smaller national corporate entities. Um, let's see, oh, the NATO type was supposed to be a Star Trek type exploration. Okay, the next one was a smaller national corporate entities, Russia and Chinese. And let's see, they were kind of like a catch all grab bag, and let's see what they say. He said, Putin's trying to get the truth out there, and Russians are trying to help us prepare humanity for the truth. So that was my notes I took down. Sometimes I speed write when I'm doing these shows. <laughs> so uh, let's see, who's next? We're kind of going round robin here. I guess John, what would you like to add to the conversation? Um, to finish the thought, um, when I was at the Experiencer Speak 4 conference in Portland, Maine on August 28th and 29th, Grant Cameron was one of the guest speakers, and he is just incredibly brilliant. And uh, he alluded to the fact that he can't share all the information that he knows. Um, a lot of people have asked him about propulsion, and he's like, it's not propulsion. It's more like Victor Schauberg you're being pulled instead of pushed. And a huge component of it is consciousness and ESP. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a consciously driven craft. So unless you have a highly evolved, mentally um, advanced individual ET behind the helm as pilot, they're not going to be able to pilot it. Uh, it requires incredible mental and spiritual energetic consciousness capacity to be able to, you know, navigate these vehicles through outer space. Um, it's not so much you have your hands on the steering wheel, where instead you have a, a crown on your head with diodes on different parts of your brain that you can communicate with, and they already have that technology in the Air Force, where pilots have these, for lack of a better term, a halo or a crown on their head, and they can navigate the craft mentally. But that's a very, very old technology, especially to ET, that um, we're not allowed to be able to use commercially. Just like, uh, just like Karen said, you know, we're pushed by um, burning liquid fuel, and we're kind of stuck in that for for now. Uh, I'd like to see us evolve beyond that, so that we, you know, quit creating chemtrails and um, all this. Uh, you know, negative exhaust that doesn't help our atmosphere and doesn't help the whole balance and energy or chi of the planet. But um, I wanted to move on to the Mars One mission. Um, Karen, I'm sure you know quite a bit about that, but um, I was doing some reading on it earlier. And uh, let's see, uh, Ken Johnston made a bid. He wanted to be a part of that program. And it's slated for 2022. And in 2018, Mars One, uh, what they do state and claim is that it is less expensive to do it through their program than it is to do it through NASA. That's their one big selling point. And they had over 2,000 applicants, and you know a small fraction of that is actually going to be allowed to be part of the mission. But it's later for 2022, and in 2018, um, Mars One intends to send a, a communication satellite to view the landing site 
and then four to five unmanned missions carrying rovers and equipment that the team will need once they actually land on Mars. And then they're going to send 10 teams of four astronauts each with two men and two women in two-year intervals to set up a base camp with inflatable greenhouses and then and also 10 by 20-foot pods that individuals are going to live in. And the one question, a couple questions arose, but one of them is, how are you going to produce oxygen? Um, I came up with the concept of cloning the O2 molecule, but I, I have no clue how you're going to create oxygen that's going to last years and years and years in a pod or a greenhouse. I'm just not sure how that technology will work. But something else reading yeah. further is that uh, Ken Johnston's wife knows it's a one-way mission. It's not a yeah. you know, it's not a return trip, and that she completely and totally loves him and supports him, even if she never sees him again. But unfortunately, in 2015, February this year, he got eliminated from the bidding process, so I don't guess he'll be able to go. What do you What do you know about that? I wanted Karen? to address the um, breathable atmosphere. Apparently, there are many whistleblowers like Randy Kramer and Corey Good and Andrew Bashago, who has given us detailed information. It is a totally breathable atmosphere on Mars, and of course, you know how you get really? acclimated. So people who are on there will acclimate mm-hmm. to the breathable atmosphere. So they probably already know that on some level, and that's why they're planning this. Otherwise, yes, that would be impossible to, you know, generate the oxygen needed, unless they already have technologies for that as well. I mean, what are they doing on the moon base? Do they have oxygen there? Are they in um, a dome city? So we have to look at what they've already come up with at least in fiction, and then you can take that and extrapolate it and bring it into what's actually going to be applied and going on. Karen, do you have any information on that? Oh, yeah. I, I first of all want to address uh, one of my heroes in this story, and that's Ken Johnston's wife, Fran. <laughs> She's amazing. Uh, I'm a member of the Fran fan club because I did think about what you were saying, John, and I thought uh, – Talk about supporting someone following their bliss to the nth degree. I thought that was kind of amazing. Um, of course, he did get cut. He was uh, promoting the program. He made the first cut, but he didn't make the last cut. And he was promoting the program as the oldest, um, you know, one that was uh, nominated uh, as a 72-year-old. And then when they finally picked people, they they went uh, 60 age or lower. And, uh, so they cut out anybody over 60 pretty much as being part of the team. And uh, so anyway, he was uh, so a little, you know, like, well, was he used to just promote it and then they were going to do this anyway? I mean, you can understand uh, some concerned feelings about that. But he's very good-natured about it, and uh, he has uh, fun memorabilia about it and, and uh, was just excited, you know. And that, now he's decided that you know, maybe maybe the ET will take him up there and he won't have to work, just bypass the whole NASA thing altogether. But what what hurts my head, what hurts my head all the time with this stuff is these layers of, um, you know, uh, exopolitics here. There's layers. There's octaves. So on the one hand, we have the, um, you know, consensus reality show space program is making these plans to do these uh, this colony situation. And then we also have the breakaway civilization who, probably has bases there already, maybe has had them a long time, either took up bases that were already there based on the work of Janet, you, and Kasha, uh, and and Zachariah Sitchin about the fact that uh, our ancient history is a story about a space-fearing races that were here a long time ago and running around all over the solar system. Uh, And then there's another layer of... um, that we've had uh, Andrew Bishago and others talking about um, that they went through in a jump room program where they went into sort of an elevator type thing that took them up to an, uh, the end point was an elevator that was on Mars. And they did, you know, various things up there with a kind of a, lo- a breathable atmosphere, but kind of like high altitude, kind of maybe lower O2 than here on the planet. So this is what's hurting my head is that to me it all sounds correct, you know, <laughs> depending on your point of view, depending on who you're, you know, which part of this thing you're involved. And it, it, it fascinates me that we have so many complexities around something 
basically kind of simple. We're going from Earth to Mars, and then you have to add another level. Is it's possible that um, humanoid beings who've been in Earth civilization have been going from Mars to the Earth to Venus to the Earth to Mars, back and forth and back and forth, depending on the sun activity, the solar activity being too hot, so they move out farther. Like, it's not just um, global warming on the Earth. Uh, A lot of the planets, as David Wilcox said, are showing signs of warming. So maybe there's a really long cycle where the Earth um, gets hotter and we all, you know, either live underground here on Earth or we have a colony up on Mars. So this is very complex stuff. Um, and the information is deep anywhere you dig. In other words, everyone has a good point, including the flat earth people. To a certain extent, they're all trying to take what data we've got, which isn't a lot if you're a regular normal person, um, you know, reading the Internet or, you know, reading a book by NASA. We, we get very little, and what we get is very conflictatory. So I'm interested in how we all process this as a group. Because we, I just want to cut to the crap and say, quit lying to us and tell us what the real thing is. It's probably a combo of the ancient alien uh, story that the you know, human, human beings and many other ET races have been here a long time. And we're going to be caught up to that. Our fiction, like Star Trek, is trying to catch us up to the idea that not everybody looks like we do. Um, and then... We have secret space programs. It sounds to me like they're kind of factional and corporate, like their own conglomerates or whatever. And these, you know, these ideas that were going to be on the surface of Mars, I I finally caught up and watched that movie, The Martian, if you guys haven't seen the issue see it with Matt Beeman on, you know, uh, you take note of how hostile of an environment Mars is. Is that really going to be realistic that you're going to be, in that environment and allow yourself to, your whole camp to be wiped out by a, you know, tornadic kind of storm, which happens in the first part. Oh, I won't tell that part. Okay. No more spoilers. But anyway, the thing is, is this is very, com- this it's is very new movie, complex. Karen, this is, it's a new movie. And I'm not going to say more about it. It's a new movie. Oh, an old movie. Yeah. It's a new movie. It's, it's called new? The Martian. Yeah. My, Matt Damon is, is starring, uh, this, and I won't say any more about it, but basically it's a colonization of Mars and how they cope with the conditions there and whatnot. It's very interesting. Oh, well, that's book. Interesting. Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah, it's, it's out. You're, it's out you're, in you're, theaters you're, right now. Yeah, it's out in theaters. theaters. And also, it's based on a book, and it's called The Martian, and please don't ask me the author's name because I haven't read the book. But um, so this is uh-huh. what we're all like asked to support. But I, I, I want to bring things down to earth for a minute because this is what okay. drives me. What my passion is is um, it bothers me that we, you know, when I was a young person and they were selling us with, with Disney and uh, talking to Werner Braun Bond about how cool that you know space exploring space is going to be. I was ready to go. I wanted to be working for NASA as a, you know, little kid, nerd child. Um, And the thing was, was the promise was so great that this would unite the world to explore space and that we'd, by solving all of these problems for going in space, we would solve, you know, problems here on Earth. And we're sitting in the middle of a drawn-out global, uh, you know, depression, recession, whatever you want to call it, and it's that was a question. If we can't feed everyone, clothe everyone, and house every house everyone, how inspiring is it that these few people get the toys to go do this cool stuff, and the rest of us are left out of? We get to watch, but we don't get to participate or benefit from it. And I've thought about this a lot over the course of my life, and I realized that you know. If there's kind of a galactic governance that says, okay, who gets to go in space, who who does it? Do you think they're going to let a civilization go out and explore space who haven't even figured out how to have people not be homeless or starving or have GMO food, low quality food? I mean, it just seems like it, that's an issue that needs to be brought in. Is is we have all of this fascinating stuff with space, but we have people that are homeless. You know, that doesn't make sense. It seems like we need to. It, it's cool. We'll go to space. Great. I don't know which way Joe and Boone, uh, breakaway civilization, the you know space secret space program craft. Um, 
conventional rockets, whatever, telepathy, you know, we'll just transport ourselves there. But why do we want to escape the planet that's took good care of us and we're not reciprocating taking good care of her and we're not taking care of each other? So that's in the mix, too, because you start looking at the numbers that it costs for all of the NASA programs, and it's billions and billions, and it kind of hurts your head when you know, you know, I have a daughter who's disabled, and they cut programs out for the disabled and for elderly and uh, for people in need, and we don't have, we have one million people that are able-bodied to work in America that don't have a job or a full-time job or they're under underemployed. So I sit right there of wait a minute, but, you know, let's find out what the truth is, but the truth better include that we've got our priorities straight. And I don't see why, if I was, uh, you know, uh, some kind of counsel saying, should we let the earthlings out of the box, you know, maybe not. If they haven't learned to get along and haven't learned to solve how to take care of their own kind. Because if you can't take care of your own kind, how are you going to handle people very different from you? And civilization is very different from you. So uh, that's kind of where I... I hold that space. I hold that space. John, your turn. <laughs> um, to your point, Karen, Are you there, I agree John? with you totally. Yeah, I'm I'm here. Um, but to your point, okay. Karen, I I agree with, agree with you totally that we're we're not spending our money on uh, on the people of our own planet. Instead, we're spending it more on outer space to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars. And I don't think we have our priorities straight as far as all that goes. But um, back in 2011, um, Ken Johnston, he joined George Knapp on an interview, and he was stating that NASA knows of evidence, concrete evidence of ancient and modern artifacts on the moon and a base, if not multiple bases. And then um, you have spoken of the, the film footage and the negatives that he, he has his hands on. And then uh, Apollo 14 film captured five domes in a crater that were lit from the inside with steam streaming above them. And then the Apollo pictures also uh, show these perfectly round holes that more resemble vents than craters. And I know there's some science to that. Can you speak of that, uh, how you can look at some of these these um, formations on the moon and be able to decipher from them being natural instead of artificial? Well, I got a better idea. I'm going to pass you to Brett because that's where his oh, uh, eyeballs <laughs> look. Yeah. And I was holding the phone next to him so he could hear your basic question. So uh, this is Brett Colin Shepard. He started the Lunar Anomaly Research Society, and he's an anomaly hunter, and he's my seller. And here he is. Hello. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hey, Brett. To the show. Hi. Yes, I, I can address that. Um, the 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 lunar um, geology and the Mar- Martian geology is is just as anomalous, you know, as as looking for structures or anything like that. Um, it is. It, I, I saw um, the original uh, Richard Hoagland Mars image, you know, that was the original scan from mm-hmm. from Mars, and and there there is a there is a place, you know, uh, in the Sidona region, which you all know about, the pyramids and the face on Mars and all that. And um, w- within that, I'm, you know, I'm uh, very Irish, you know, with Scottish background and that sort of thing. So, you know, Druidic type you know, scenario. And I, I'm interested in looking for like Druidic type structures or, or old ancient ruins and such. And uh, in that image, there's a very large circle um, and it is part of the landscape, the formation or whatever. Um, and, and I don't think it's a plateau. You know, it, it's, it looks like um, something had, had tracked in a circle for years, you know. Uh, so it's a very unusual formation. And, and I've also seen things like that on the moon. Um, and, and one particular image, those, I'll tell you guys, those images are wonderful. They, they, they start out from the uh, Apollo um, combined American uh, Soviet mission um, Soyuz um, to the Gemini um, <clears throat> test flights, you know, uh, all the way through um, the the Apollo Im- uh, missions that we mostly know, you know, 10, 11, 12, where we actually put men on the moon, and the, the some of these images are 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 incredible, and they they show. 
um, what what very much looks like ancient formations and structures. You know, um, the, the 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 geology of of some of this stuff um, is is very interesting because just as as you would go to a dig site or something in an ancient uh, village or something like that, um, you would study the geology of it to get to um, the the actual structure because the geology can tell you what happened, like in Pompeii, with the volcanic activity and such. You know, uh, the, the, these are clues as to whether something is maybe buried underneath all that. You know, okay. So in these pictures, there's very clear um, right angle blocks carved out and and there's also a face on the moon so i i would i, I you know in that particular image i would call that the face uh, of the moon basically you know in that one image and this is a wonderful okay, little complex like. be oh my gosh it looks uh, you know you wouldn't believe it but it looks like a like a clownish type bozo looking face a isn't that weird face Yes. Yeah. Yes. What, what makes it look clownish? Um, I, I, I does guess it have a big the um, nose or something is it? Yes, it it kind of does a little bit, and it it's um it's very feminine, round, um, structural pieces around the face. You know, like it like curly hair or something. Uh huh. <laughs> is that, does that sound strange? Uh, and the, this we're um, be able to see it doesn't. We're all we're all oh, like on gosh. the edge of our. You will be able to see them very soon. I'm going to put, put them together in a very nice way, you know, starting with the first mission all the way to the end, you know. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow up these these particular anomalies that I'm talking about and just let people decide mm -hmm. for themselves, you know. I'm not going to draw on them and go, this is what this is and that's what that is. Um, I think people are smarter than that. And and there's, mm -hmm. there's, one, there's one image that that one image in particular, you know, has – has like a structural type building that looked like it'd been there for a very long time. It looks buried and it, it has right angle walls and it's, it's shaped like sort of a, um, um, this sort of, um, a flat tetrahedron shape, you know, mm -hmm. um, it, it, except for like, um, the, the end of it is square. It's like, like a squared off diamond or something. It's really unusual. You guys are going to like it. Are these images clear or are they fuzzy? Like a lot of they are, ab fuzzy. they are absolutely. Well, you know the Hasselblad camera, um, the way it does the background normally is kind of fuzzy. But in some of these images, they they've purposely set the f stop to to focus in on the background. You know, hmm. um, so it, as far as that goes, it's as clear as it can be. It's a lot clearer than what NASA put out. Because they lowered the DPI to half or lower than half. Do are they in color? Uh, most of them are are in black and white, and there's a there's a really good reason for that. It was cheaper. That was the initial reason oh, uh, because it yeah it you know they could pay their employees more or something. Um, it, it was cheaper <laughs> and <laughs> you know and it, that um. Basically, um, Ken, Ken Johnston, who was working at the L, uh, LRL um, Lunar Receiving Laboratory at the time, um, he encouraged them to use color. He said, you know, that, that you can get just as much detail in color. And um, he, he was there in that little board meeting or whatever that where then they decided to to put them in black and white, you know. And so he, he put the idea forward, let's just do it in black and white. It, it'll save a lot of money, and, and the, the images are just as clear, you know, either way. Um, the, the thing is that, that I have a problem with with that is that you lose a lot of geological um, data from that because uh, you can tell from an image, you know, what, if, if something is oxidized or, you know, there are different things like that. So if it has oxygen and presence of oxygen and uh, or moisture or water or something like that. Um, yeah, there, you can you can tell um, like if it's a bluish rock or if it's you know um, a brownish type color. Um, you have a clue there, you know, as to to what kind of um, elements are on the moon. You know, so that that would would have been a very important thing for them. But I guess they had analyzed the, the lunar rocks 
when they got back. And they did a full spectrum analysis on it. And it, it, they went through all of the all of the elements on the chart, and and they picked out the elements, and they're the same elements of Earth, in essence. Wow. Yeah. So so this is very related. Um, as far as it being a big mothership, I I really don't think so. You know, I there by now there may be hollowed out areas where. Um, they have massive underground facilities and um, different um, structural things that they've done all over inside the moon, just like Earth. You know, Earth, they have all kinds of bases underground now and and um, very large facilities. And and it's like a, a, a honeycomb of um, caves, systems, and everything else. And the moon is very similar. It has a lot of lava caves. So the, these um, lava tube caves that were created, you know, when when lava was like squeezing out, you know, of the of the moon, um, it, it it created this um, glass-like hollow area, you know. And um, I I got some tips from um, someone that were that is still working in the black ops program, and he said that they have bases mm-hmm. inside the lava tubes, you know, to protect them from the elements and so on. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. as Camellia, I had a movie with the, the a big uh, spaceship. Are you familiar with the? And there's pictures if you Google it, you can see all these images. Are you familiar with that? Oh yes, yeah. The, I've I've I found a lot of those types of giant formations and spaceships. And um, he talks about the ones around the sun also. And uh, yes, those are. Um, those are incredible. Um, there's one I, you know, the the one I found on Mars. I think it's more of an observation deck or something. It looks like a big UFO on Mars, but you can you can look up that information on um, U, UFO on Mars. dot com. Right. And you know, there, there there's some Maybe. information about that. Uh, there there is John, there, there are all kinds of. Oh yeah, please. Okay. Good. Yeah, John. This. Um, Oh, okay. Um, Just to let him uh, Brett, voice. Is, is it within the? Is it? I'm sorry. Is it within the realm of possibility that NASA actually did have original color photos, but didn't share them with the scientists and kept the color ones, uh, and gave Ken the black and whites because of those yes. exact uh, anomalies that you pointed out, like oxidation. Yeah. You can tell different geological and geographical differences and just realities based on color and color separation and difference in colors? I can tell you that's a fact because I have It is a fact. Them. Yes. Uh, really? Okay. That is a fact. Yeah. And the reason why they would film them in black and white is because they look better when you turn them back into grayscale or color or, you know, grayscale or black and white from color. So that 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 is a fact. You bet you. And the well, astronauts are yeah. right. The, most of the surface that they – had encountered was a sort of a tannish color, and some of the Maris are bluish colored and reddish. Um, I had another question for you also. Are you familiar with the Russian crafts and the Russian rovers and orbiters that uh, oh, yeah. got a lot of the same footage? Like, for example, yes. the Lunik 13 Russian craft uh, found a drilling device. I mean, yes. Some kind of drilling device, some kind of industrial drilling device with smokestacks, uh, with smoke yes, coming out correct. of them. Yes. And then a, a Russian orbiter also found a fractured dome on the moon's yes, surface. There, there are you know, definitely technological artifacts that are very old on the moon. So we have been there, and I and I, I believe that we've we've been there in cycles. You know, but, um, based on the solar cycle, we would move from one planet to another. And I think the moon was one of our stops, um, just as, as part of our history in particular. Um, there's a complexity because there's there's the history. There's there's uh, races of beings that are coming from all over the universe, and I, I think the moon has been pretty much a pit stop, you know, on the way to Earth. And um, they they left the, a lot of junk behind, you know. And I, I think that's what they what what some of the Soviets have found, you know, in the early uh, Luna missions. You know, there was the Luna two, I believe, and the um, 
I forget what their rover was called. What kind of junk um, have they found? Oh my gosh! Should they have a lot of. T- they did. They, they well. They, there's um, there are um, bent pieces of metal. There there's um, actual columns that were in part of uh, some kind of building or something. And uh, these are these, these columns are are surrounded by broken up concrete. You know. And these are all like at right angles and stuff, you know. So that's it's definitely made by some beings, you know, or us. And um, I, I I know the image that you're talking about with the with the big drill thing that's just sitting there on the surface. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I love that picture. And there's um, um, the the one um, the, where where um, I, I believe Mike Barris said that, that it was on the horizon and that was like a broken dome or something like that. And I had analyzed that, that image and compared it with some of the other images. I don't, I don't believe that that um, um, was necessarily man-made. I think it was a lava formation that broke, you know what I mean? But it's there. Now the point is, is that it is there, but they, they may, because, you know, some, some of us have said, well, that's definitely some kind of man-made dome or something. Now, scientists or geologists or something, they don't even want to look at it or what? See, I'm a little confused by that because that's not science. That's not discovery. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's often easier to ignore something that they don't want to acknowledge. Um, but, right, uh, so he, something's going on, yeah. So Steve Troy, he said that he found some crystalline rebar that looked like remnants of larger structures and construction. Are you familiar with any of Steve Troy's work and findings? Uh, yes, I am. I am very familiar with his work. We're, we're trying to connect with him, in fact, <laughs> okay, um, I figured. O- over a lot of a lot of Ken Johnston's material, and we would like his opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, please call us or something. Um, yeah, there. Um, I'm very familiar with the the, the lunar missions um, from the the Russians. You know, they actually had um, an intended mission to Mars, um, where where with one of their their satellites. You know, kind of like our Viking satellite, and mm-hmm. their, I believe it was Sputnik. You know, and mm-hmm. it it went out um, and and missed the Mars window. You know, as far as like when Mars would appear at a certain time and whatnot. But what they did catch really good pictures of is the star Vega. And I, I had animated that sequence, you know, for the Soviet lunar group. You've worked with the Soviet lunar group. Yes. Um, with, wow. uh, actually, uh, actually formed that group on Facebook. It's a Facebook I, group. Wow. I didn't know that. Oh, just... Extraordinary. Oh yeah. And I actually um, colorized all of the, the, all of the old um, Luna images. It's the Sea Luna series and all that, and mm-hmm. that, um, that there is um, um, very interesting. There's incredible structures in that, you know. Some that Richard Hoagland had pointed out back in '96, I believe, um, um, uh, different formations. And these these images were captured by that satellite that I'm talking about that missed the Mars window, but they were there right on time to see some of these structures at a particular um, precise time when they when it would fly over the horizon a certain way so that you could see um a big spire, you know, on the horizon. So that's a very interesting thing. I remember seeing a Hopeland video where he had the towers that were like seven feet tall. And I haven't seen yes. those lately. Do you want to talk yes. about that? What do you know about those? Um, he, he, I believe he called it the, um, um, gosh, what did he call it? No, oh, what did he call that little thing that sticks up in the moon? One of the spires or. Yeah. Yeah. There were towers. Yeah. There, no. There's, uh, oh, okay. the, like these, these very large tower formations on the moon, you know, and we, and we don't know if they're natural or not, but they're definitely some kind of natural technological formation and what i mean by that they're huge they're miles high not just seven feet they're yeah, miles they're like, high i was like 100 like miles and high i remember yeah. oh here i found mm-hmm. some pictures of them oh i i was aware of these you know what 20 years ago or something 
And then I yeah. had a, uh, I'm an experiencer, so they took me to the base of one of these towers. It was a future time, and it was yes. a, a system of for power. It was definitely connected to a grid. Yes, it grid. is. Um, a, a lot of the formations on the moon are for power. They're 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 for you know to get energy from the sun and so on. They've got giant dishes and everything else. They really do. Um, there, there's one um, image in particular that I was looking at um, recently, and it, it was an Apollo 15 mission image of the um, command module, and then there's the lunar surface in the background. Um, it's very high up, like you know, 65 miles from the surface, and you can see a literally a a, an array of shiny dishes on the surface. That's a parabolic right. array, so, you know, just like you know you would see in the middle of the desert or something. So these and, pictures yeah, for, com- that for were, communication or whatever. These pictures that were taken, did were they uh, the astronauts uh, told to avoid these structures or to focus on them? Um, they, they, yes, they have very, very clear pictures of them, and scientists actually did study these in debriefing. But what they showed us was um, literally a um, half-resolution type image, and they found ways to 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 go half-resolution, and it would blur it out, you know, completely almost. Does that make sense? Well, it seems so, to me yeah, they, they probably they're very didn't, crystal uh, clear images. Yeah. all these these images that they were, you know, guarding a secret here. Yeah, they 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 are guarding a secret and um and it it seems to me that um as far as their mentality goes, why would they do that? Why would they uh, protect the secret? Um uh, obviously, that you know, that some of these elitist groups they benefit by these secrets, right? And um, that it seems to me that um, on a on a deeper level, uh, spiritually or whatever, that a, a lot of them have kept quiet, you know, um, for the sake of balance or something like that or continuity. So I believe that there's some kind of secret continuity type organizational thing behind all this. I know that sounds awful, but, you know, I believe that's true. I I think that is the mindset. Yeah, there's a decision-making body making these decisions. Um, And I don't think we're as much a part of that decision-making process as we'd like to think that we are. No, we're not at all. Not at all. Not not if someone has um, literally... um, can control the perception of something that they know that most people have no ability to go look at themselves. You know, it always seems like the so original what do you think pictures. They're hiding? Uh, they, oh, my, my brother they, said to me one time, wise man, he says, it's not what they, the Anunnaki told us is what they're hiding. So it's not what the, uh, the powers that be have revealed to us through have these pictures. Well, they're, you know? they're, they are so, definitely... Yeah, they are definitely hiding the fact that there are extraterrestrials in real life, not sentient beings, which they're, they will those exist as well. Um, but sentient beings, is that the right word? Um, that not not just those, but there's also physical beings out there, you know, that live a different way, you know, that um, that have been in communication with us through through graphics, usually graphics. It's usually um, um, graphics made from sound waves. So these these are very specific ways to communicate universally um, through music or sound, you know. Um, and sound, believe it or not, it actually forms a picture. And so they've, right. they've learned how to form how form pictures from from sound waves. And um, early scientists um, had had discovered this by accident, you know, when they were trying to communicate um, in different ways with Mars by listening to the signal. And what they got back, you know, um, from the the noise from Mars were literally images of of humanoid beings. 
so that there's there, there's that aspect of it and i know that the um the et groups that that we've been in communication with love to communicate through imagery you know so there's different ways they do that and one of the ways is they they use um um nasa's um importance of of uh, lowering the resolution on uh, by you know digital formats and computers and whatnot well they'll lower the resolution and and the uh, ets have the advantage in they can actually manipulate that particular time when it's lowered in uh, in the computer so when when this is lowered in the computer with ones and zeros now we're talking about uh, something that you can manipulate. It's digital, and they slip in these storyboard-like pictures within the NASA imagery. And the reason why I think that is because they're um, in, in the very large resolution images that I've had the pleasure of looking at. They are um, they they are not there. You know, the the same um, types of graphic anomalies that an artist can see even in the black and white images, you know. Isn't that strange? Fascinating. So for, from the research that I have been studying about, you know, how they insert things in auditory or visual rays, the extraterrestrials yeah. can do this, the uh, uh, discarnate ghost or whatever, that's how they communicate. So you're saying they're using some kind of um, I I don't know what the technology would be called, but they're using some kind of technology, and they and you're saying they're not p- appearing on some, but they're seeing. Yeah, say that again. I I kind of miss what you were saying there because blowing my mind. Yeah, they they <laughs> sort of uh, they they can sort of use the morphogenic type field of energy to change or manipulate um, a certain time period of graphics that are that are manipulated on purpose to hide what they are, you know? So it's kind of a joke, really, because they're they're um they're putting in all of this information, all all of inf- all information inside these images while they're being the, the resolution is being lowered or they're being tampered with. Because we are part of um that creation process. You know, uh, so in a in a universal way, we're communicating. We're you've got these artists and stuff at NASA that are um, try, painting out the stars and whatnot. Well, their energy right. is going in, in into all of that. You know, and, and they're getting a response when those images are processed and whatnot. There's there there's a response there from the ethers, you know, or something. So it's a very unusual process. And I, I believe it's partly natural. It's just like um, you know when 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 you go out and you commune with nature or something, and you see the faces in the mountains and so on. You know, or dogs right. in the clouds or this or that. Um, I I don't think that that's arbitrary. Cloud. Yeah, I don't think that's completely arbitrary. I think that's some type of communication. Right, because that's our deeds and what we, yeah. It's a law of attraction and action So we focus on something And we get these responses Have you ever played with zapping clouds You know group of you will focus oh, on yes. We're going to zap that cloud, It disappear and yeah. break into its With some kind of um, Part of it I guess is what you're saying Is that we're learning that we are Participatory in our environment That it's not random That we are actually effective And what yes. we're thinking and doing And that we are communicating, and they're just sending it back. I was working, or I didn't work with them. I was reading a book. My husband was working with them. It was a group that was um, trying to communicate the life beyond life, you know, the people who had crossed over. And, it, and they were working on this for over 100 years. So that they were creating this array, and they were getting pictures of their members, and they would be uh, posing with, you know, famous or infamous people who had died, <laughs> Just so you would understand, here somebody was recognizable, and right. here was a member of the, this. And they created a computer array, and they would also show uh, scenes of what the other side looks like. You know, it had buildings and trees and everything oh, yeah. else. So, 
so this is something like that. Yeah, I, I, I think it. Yeah, I think it is part of that. Is part of the complexity, as the an attempt to communicate with us. You know, I think that's what it is. And it, it, looking at um, looking at these images, I wouldn't presume um, um, too much at all when I'm looking at them because I I don't um, completely assume that that's of the moon. You know, when I'm looking at these images, though I've got enough evidence, I'll tell you that that we did go to the moon, and those are images of the moon. I think they're just tampered with. You know what I mean? Wow. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, they're heavily heavily tampered with. Um, they they had a, a, a huge PR campaign, you know. It was the Cold War. And instead of a, a world war, we had a, we had a space race. Mm-hmm. You know, so we had a so space race instead. So how does this tie in with... And, but the secret space programs. So this is information um, the, they're allowing to come out. My my yes. thoughts, my theory is there's nothing out there that they're not allowing it to come out. And so all yeah, the when, yeah, they're 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 ready. And, yeah, they're they're ready to come out with it, and they're they're not really holding back too much because they they've really burned out the cycle, you know of. Um, collecting all the resources and, and uh, pretty much nabbing everything. I mean, they they are giving us very little to live with and live on, you know, and um, resource wise. And the thing is, is it's it, it's such an abundant system, you know. But but they're it, it's so controlled. They're only giving us very little, you know, of whatever because they and there's no uh, running out of resources. How could you, you know? It constantly replenishes itself, especially on Earth. And the 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 thing is, is um, the the secret space program is is protecting you know that aspect of it, the the resource grabbing type aspect, and they're also mm-hmm. protecting the religion and geopolitical aspect. So they're, they're, those are some some things that they're protecting, but they're. Um, they're they're trying to come out with it in a way that doesn't destroy the the world, um, the the way the construct is now because they love this construct, they just want to reboot it or start over or something, and I don't think that'll work this time. Um, I I, I, I believe that, that, yeah, I don't think that they're going to go back and let's start over for you know the Roaring Twenties or something. I just don't think well, it, I see it that way. Like another yeah. war. I guess the, um, another war got launched. I didn't pay attention, but my husband said, "Oh, yeah. well, they're doing another war." Obama just sent troops. I, I'm so uh, it's all I'm it's all completely attention. fake. Like, yeah. Oh, come on, really? It's all completely but, manipulated. Um, I'll have yeah. To ask. I I just feel it's just a bunch of bull crap. And yes, and it, it's just, all look know, over look over here and don't pay any attention to what we're doing over over here and stuff. You know. So they've got their secret Elysium type space program, which you know the, the, my friend said that they've got um, ships that make Star Wars look stupid. You know, I mean he's got really these great um, ships that that um, apparently um, on a regular basis go to the moon and back. I heard you know by interviewing people like uh, Randy Kramer and yeah. Um, Dr. Michael Sala, who had or interviewed Corey Good and even Andrew Bashago, yeah. but the Corey Good information they're saying that we we already travel throughout the entire solar system and we're, and we're beyond the solar system. It's so right. it is Star Trek. It already yeah, is Star that, Trek. that's TV exactly events. that's exactly right. We're and sort of in a I'm zoo so ready type environment. For this whole new because Me too. Enough, you know, Karen and I. Have endlessly about how they just keep us starving and and lack consciousness and you know we we don't need to have poor and homeless we can feed everybody we can house everybody we could uh, put people on different planets that need more population yeah. and everybody could live in and they uh, Sasha was looking at the, the paper and reading something because they're that would be very the profound paper yeah is just so primitive Reality that you know we're so. It, it would end like that. Yeah. Bogging is my mind, and it's like we know better. 
when is the rest of the world going to catch up? So we keep doing these shows, but how yeah, can we good. get this to where it finally breaks through? And this is the new operating system, one that is fair across the board. And like uh, Karen was saying the first half of the show that, you know, Ken really wanted to go to the Mars and he's getting written off because he's over 50. But the reality is we have extreme longevity and physical immortality and right. you know, Ken could go to Mars on a weekend and come home to his wife. But we're just being denied all this information. Right. It's being in, It's being held in this quote-unquote breakaway civilization. And it's not right, but is it ever it isn't. It's absolutely, it's absolutely wrong. You know, it's it's full of uh, you know universal egos and everything else. And it's not just humans that are that are having the ego problem. You know, uh, there's a there's beings out there that have you know very large egos. You know, yeah, and Zeus had like twenty wives. You know, yeah, exactly. And demigods you know, so, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, there's all these uh, so-called god alien beings out there, and and they're you know they they've put their foot down about some things. You know what I mean? Um, they they've kept us in some kind of zoo, and it, and we don't need to be that way. It should be more experience based and less you know um, less anger, you know, less aggression toward the truth, you know, some truth that doesn't even really exist. Because the truth is our experience. Yeah. Are we creating this? Is this a co-creation? Is there a part of us that is yes. joining the Federation? Yeah. Is yes, it's people? a very complex co-creational thing. But can't you like feel the end of the cycle there. coming up? Yes, is at yeah. the end of this cycle, yes. Yeah, absolutely. you can feel it. I really believe it. You can it. feel it. You can feel it. it. It's it's in the air. It's in the energy and the just our immediate energy, our planetary energy, and it's necessary. Yeah. And that's why so many experiencers are starting to come out. And you know, within the next yeah, we're years you know we're, we're putting forth something. some information, but it is the tip mm-hmm. of the iceberg compared to what they're hiding. That's absolutely oh, tip of the iceberg. You know, I don't of think of it even Trek. as a big deal. I'm like, here, okay, here's some of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, instead of Star Trek us traveling at warp speed, it's more like Star Wars and us traveling through hyperspace. And I believe yes. that's very, very old technology with our secret space program. D Glock was built right around 1940 or whatever. And then that technology was brought here to the United States by Werner von Braun and other German scientists. And it they've is. been it's using a, it. it. That is either. Um, that is either the case and a and a serious reality, which I believe that as well. Or they need to stop lying to us and um, make it like the old days when we could go with Grandpa and Grandma in the, uh, you know, in, in the Winnebago across America without being harassed, you know. Or you, you know, we 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 could just live on this planet, you know, um, the way we're meant to. You know what I mean? Yeah. Karen brought it up you know, earlier. It's it's all based <laughs> on making money. You know, it's all based on yeah. selling liquid fuel. We that is such a a completely dead, dead technology. You know, there's free energy all around us. Tesla was trying to broadcast power from the Earth to Mars. You know, I mean, absolutely. There's a very clean technology out there. And he said he was receiving from an ET from Mars, and that's where they coined the term "mad scientist" back in the day. Yes. And what's also interesting is the term "curious George." Guess who his young yeah. protege was back back in the day? It was oh, wow. George Bush George Bush Senior. George Bush Senior. Oh wow. Was his protege. Was, wait, yeah, I've George Bush two? Senior. George protege Bush Senior was, uh, was Tesla's protege when he was like fifteen, sixteen years old and he was basically yes. stealing secrets from him. And uh, <laughs> he was a covert government operative back then, and nobody even really knew. Yeah, absolutely. I thought he was you know, a I, kid, I just, you know? um, I just, I just think that we're we're all together on this, you know, and and we're all doing our part in putting forth the information that we have experienced. You know, I I think that's a great thing to do, and uh, it 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 starts a new paradigm. So, it is, and we're in the know, shift right now like a, from the old stuff. Mm-hmm. We're in the shift right now. 
yeah. Are we reaching critical mass? And what does uh, we have to bring uh, Ken back, Ken Johnson back on to see what he thinks? Cause he, he's oh yeah, he, he would. But are we, he would like that uh, very reach, much. <laughs> I know today um, it wasn't um, going to work for him, but there be somebody out there that has the awareness of how this will go from the one paradigm to the other. Because it, it's coming yeah. out in mass all over the place. People are aware of it. They're conscious. They're getting it. And then it's like it's like you're going through two different worlds. We're, we just spent a weekend at, at the Experiences Conference. And we're talking yeah, one, about one thing. Um, one, one thing that's – oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think one a very important thing to do is to correct history in order for us to, you know um, – it doesn't need to be completely forgotten because we've seen that utopian scenario. You know, it's it's like there's a bunch of old men in a room and they decide um, who dies at their 21st birthday. You know what I mean? So we we can't really kind of ignore history, but it needs to be corrected. It really does. And and one of the things that I'm doing is is trying to at least correct the space race history. You know. And to help um, Ken Johnston and, and others that have come forward to correct that history, because it, it really is a wonderful, rich history of of our our human attempt to go to space. You know, and and these guys that were early on in the space program when rockets were blowing up and they were still willing to strap themselves into one, those guys are heroes. You know. Right. They're well, either we, we completely one, stupid uh, or they're heroes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're heroes. They are. We had one, her, uh, her name is uh, Cynthia Crawford, and she makes these sculptures of the uh, extraterrestrials. But she was sharing oh, yeah. her story, and she said her father allowed them to, uh, she's like a clone of three different species. She's full of this alien DNA she had a twin sister. Genetically, they're not even related. She's not related to her family. It was like so much evidence, and she she had right. problems. She couldn't donate to her own identical twin because um, yes. and her father finally that, said, that's, her, yeah, um, that, I, that's I, almost like yeah, that's like waking up to an to a, an awareness of of the reality of yourself. You know, it's like oh, okay. that happened. Karen said that her heart is so on the right his, side the, of her the chest. The dad said I had and, to do it. I was in the military. I got, you know, he got perks and benefits for his own child, his own biological child And while she was in the womb. How many people are getting uh, genetically, you know, manipulated? <laughs> and and to what uh, purpose? You know, are they trying to create some kind of super species or something? I'm not sure what they were doing with her, so she's trying to sort it out, but... You know, these types of stories are coming forth that it's so perverse. They've got this secret space program. They've got this uh, mm-hmm. secret genetic program that the, yes, the you know. Yes, it's funny, but the secret space are... program has always been secret. Mm-hmm. It's always so it's been one of those secret. Things that, yes, it's always been secret. It's one of those things that we're trying to correct is, historically. <laughs> You know, but we're doing it right now because we're talking about it. You know, it takes individuals like us to talk about it and collaborate. And a lot of the material that we discuss, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of similarities. You know, we're either downloading it and or we're researching it. But there's a number of us. We've mentioned at least 10 individuals that have been, you know, made famous by writing about it and going on interviews and TV and radio shows. And I think it's. Uh, responsibility of us to do this. Yeah, um, my, I have a, a very, people. very direct, yeah, very, very direct, um, focused energy toward correcting that history. I, I have no ego about any of this crap, and I wish it never was put in my hands. In a way, <laughs> you know. So it's it, it's it's really been mentally tormenting for me. So I really don't have any egotistical interest in shoving it out there. Um, Aside from I want to correct the history, I want to say, okay, here it is, guys. And what, what, however these guys want to get this information out, I will do that for them. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Well, and you're doing it with these two books yes. also. 
Yes. I'm very excited about the autobiography and the photo journal. Two different yeah. books. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that together. I'll, I will do the best I can, and it's it's going to be wonderful. Yes, it is wonderful that you're devoting so much time and energy to get that out for the planet and for Ken. You know, uh, Ken's an older gentleman, and sometimes they don't know the uh, the different systems. It's nice to be able to help people. I have I have so many friends out there that that we could have thousands of books that are you know, describing what really went on behind the scenes, but some people are just not, you know, technologically savvy enough to get it out there. I mean, I need help. I could do 10 more books if I had help. <laughs> and you don't have enough oh, time. Yes. You're so busy in survival, and i got to go figure out how to pay the the electric bill, which, you know, when you think about it, we shouldn't have electric bills. <laughs> that, that's energy. exactly right. I mean, it, you know, uh, pe- people should support their their writers, especially if they're writing about something that they're um, definitely interested in. Um, they, people out there should support writers that are coming forth with information. And it, it's we're a family, you know, all of us. We mm-hmm. are all a family, and and so like a family, we take care of each other with our resources. You know, that's how we do things. And that that's um so buy that, our that, books. that's a wonder. Yes, buy our books, books you know. Then, we'll buy your books. And you buy our books and that's how that works. Can... Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. <laughs> Karen's still there. I love talking I mean, to you guys. You it's both... great. It's great talking. Can you both can you both talk? I uh, maybe she has something to say. Just just share the mic. So yeah, sure so I'll, I'll get Karen going, hey, here. <laughs> okay, hold on. Don't leave. Don't leave. Just pass the mic, okay? We only have about a half uh, hour left. All okay. right, well, what do you have to say about all that was just said and shared? Uh, well, I'm just figuring it out from uh, we're listening to one side of the conversation, but I was really glad that Brett got to share what he's experiencing um, we're both in a state of awe because we have known about this story about Ken and all this information uh, that, you know, of how things are manipulated and the, the story, the propaganda. Well, I like to call NASA a brand, you know, it's like a brand. And in some ways it's become a person, you know, how corporations become pers- a person, you know, there's a, there's a really bad court uh, ruling from the Supreme Court saying that a corporation is a human. And it fascinates me reading up on the material that we see on the internet where it says NASA says that there's water on Mars or NASA says there's like it's a person now, right? I thought about going uh, I thought about I thought about going for Halloween as NASA. <laughs> this, this this pronouncement was big hey, there you da, go. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, NASA says da, 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 da. <laughs> right. Well and that's well, what does that's NASA I, look like you were t- as Halloween, for Halloween know. as NASA. That's a really that's what I couldn't decide for the Halloween costume. Uh, um, n- probably someone with a scroll <laughs> because they pronounce things, you know. <laughs> oh, NASA NASA is a mask. How about that? So Ooh. we really don't know what NASA looks like. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. Oh my gosh, I love that. Um, because yeah, that is the, that is the thing happening here is the masking and and uh, I'm working. One of my favorite parts of working with Ken's story recently is he had quite a bit of material about in 1996 when um, he hooked up with Richard Hoagland and they went uh, they and some other people went to the National Press Club and did a press conference about some of these artifacts and things that were being found in lunar images. And uh, and how I'm always interested in, you know, when somebody says, here it is, how come it goes away or it doesn't stick in our brain? Or, you know, when somebody presents you with something you really need to look at, somehow some operation happens of people behind masks, I love that, suddenly direct your attention away, like when the, the magician waves the scarf and you can't see that he just stuck the rabbit under the, you know, the, the hat that he's about to pull out, you know, that, um, um, you know, creating a narrative and a story and, uh, uh, you know, a brand is to put the best face forward, you know, um, 
I hate to tattle on it was a subway, I believe that the you know Jared, the dude that was always on the subway commercials, apparently uh, was a pedophile that came out, and so they're now trying to distance themselves from quite a bit of branding history where they kind of rested on this guy. And uh, uh, this happens. They'll have somebody who's an icon or whatever, and then they they kind of fall forward. So so for people who are trying to promote something, um, for instance, I clearly remember as a young person seeing the films that were done by Werner Braun Vaughn with uh, Disney. And so they were utilizing, of course, the the Nazis were very much invested in propaganda and how to – you know, they had to sell Hitler, okay? <laughs> so uh, all the things that they did where Hitler always looked really heroic and, and, and they had this vision of their country. And, you know, that's something where, you know, then Germany at the end of the war finds out about the concentration camps and the atrocities and things. And, um, you know, that's a, that's something that's in their you know, like national consciousness of what happened there, you know? America's going to go through that. I think when we began to correct history, the history, you know, not the one that was advertised and was sold in books with pretty pictures, but what actually happened, it's going to be, it's going to be important for people to go back to Roswell. Like we're two hours from Roswell. I can't wait till we actually travel out there. Um, And then we're here in New Mexico with a lot of, um, you know, research and development and behind the scenes happen. And we start to discover we have had a lot of that money that we saw it went to NASA. I mean, it went to the secret space program. And one of the interesting talks in the secret space program conference the year before last was uh, Catherine Austin Fitz. Look up secret space program conference Catherine Austin Fitz. Her speech is the budget. She's a money girl. She, she works on budgets and where they're siphoning off all of these programs to siphon off money for secret technology development. So we're, those of us who are my age and younger, um, we didn't exactly benefit from all of this. You know, you have to be a bit older and you have to be a bit in a higher echelon to benefit financially and whatnot from all of these programs. The 99% of us who didn't, um, have a right to call into question where did the money go? Show me the money. What do we what do we have? What do, is this true that we have a brand? Did we have a very complex mask? You know, we like almost like a Mardi Gras mask with all kinds of um you know, spangles and, 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 and glitter and, and but who is that behind the mask? Um so we got we've got an uncomfortable period to go through once the revelations do come out. Brett's often said Real history is a bit of a thud. It just kind of it's it's not as sexy and not as fun as the story. Um, however, the truth is so important because we can't build on anything on a lie. We can't build anything significant and sustainable on you know obviously our fuel paradigm. We can't build a sustainable fuel paradigm, uh, energy paradigm, with the way we've done. Uh, up to this point, we're finding we're in we're coming to the end of that age. We have to build it on some other basis, and the basis that we're looking at that the secret space program and others is actually based on how nature actually works energetically underneath our manifested reality. So this is important stuff, and and some of us got to hold spaces for old stories so that we get it straight if we can, and I'll let people decide. I, I'm a little bit stuck with something you said, um, and I think you were making an analogy with the United States and the uh, Auschwitz and the prison camp. So you're saying, and I could be wrong, <laughs> what I'm getting here, are you saying that when the story comes out, they're going to have atrocities about the United States that are similar to the prison camps, uh, the Auschwitz-type camps? From World War Two, uh, that's very possible. Our war effort—we're in a state of a permanent war economy where it's—it's it's one of our major industries. So that's something we need to think mm-hmm. about if we want a peaceful planet. That's not such a good idea. 
to continually invest in uh, war, and 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 that's part of the reasons why a lot of technology that is secret that's been developed has been classified as a national security, you know, secret because. It, there's technologies, for instance, what Tesla discovered with scalar technology can either be used for energy or it can be used for a weapon. So a lot of things we don't know about because it can be weaponized. And so we've got right. some choices to make of, of what do we want. Do we want to take a good idea and constantly weaponize it? And, and it has to be secret because it's been used that way. Or do we start to, you know, decide that we want, uh, prosperity and peace, and for everyone, you know, to and I know it sounds pie in the sky for a lot of people. And it's just a, what's wrong with pie in the sky? <laughs> what's wrong with having? I mean, what's the point of all of this? We the American people trust our our scientists, uh, our scientific industries, and all of this. They're trusting they're going to make our life better. That's the reason why we invested in it, even if it's protection oriented, even if it's for, for defense. The idea was to improve things for humanity. My great grandfather was an inventor, and he, he his intention was to make sure that the world was a better place after he left. And his particular invention was a signal that brings the arm down in front of cars so they don't cross in front of a train. That was his uh, invention. And um, he oh, lost wow. all his money, unfortunately. Yeah, he lost all his money in the Depression because he sold his patent and bought stocks, and then it went south and the family history is that after that go they went from a mansion to living under a bridge and we and my grandmother told wonderful stories of how they survived. But it's like his intention was they were losing a lot of money because people's jalopies would stop at the train you know, across the train tracks and they didn't know the train was coming and they'd be trying to fix it right there on the tracks and it was a disaster. And it was of course costing the railroads millions of dollars and in uh, you know, insurance claims. And so that was his intention, was to make the world a better place. That's what I think most inventors, including Nikola Tesla, they want to make the world a better place. Well, we've had a pretty prolonged series of time, a whole century, the whole last century, where a lot of the stuff that inventors came up with was utilized in war. And, again, I'm going back to the idea of is that, you know, if if somehow getting asked to the grown-ups table <laughs> as a species – with the ET races, I think one of the you know graduating factors has to be that we are thinking in terms of uh, prosperity, abundance, and peace instead of um, you know a permanent war type scenario. So I don't know, maybe you know I I, uh, I don't know if that resonates with everyone. It's just a situation where um, this figures in to whether we're allowed to use the technology that has been developed or not, whether it's behind a wall or behind a mask. I love that, or you know what? What we have to make a decision collectively. We have to learn to get along with the resources that we have, and to a part of the allowance of new technology is that it's not going to be used for for some negative way. And um, uh, we have a we have a sobering kind of process that we have to go through: a waking up, a sobering process, and a maturing as a species that we've been sort of hung up in permanent teenage teenagerhood like that guy that's, you know, 45 years old living in his parents' basement, you know, never grows up. Um, we we got to grow up. we got to grow up and be mature and responsible and hold our leaders accountable because there are more of us than there are of them. And it, it can't just be we listen, okay, some of us talking intelligently about it. You know, we, we're helping Ken. There's just a few of us trying to do this stuff. And I was very challenged with someone saying, um, don't just listen to us. Look it up and uh, tackle a problem. Address a problem. Write a book, like Brett said, or learn about something and and present that. Everyone has to be involved. Great. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our show. That was very fast, two hours. Uh, I'd like to give everybody a chance to make their final statements and comments and Tell us, uh, listeners, how to reach them. Would you like to go first, and then we'll pass it to Brett, and then we'll pass it to John. Um, yeah, final comments. Um, uh, my for me is to dig in and learn for yourself. Um, 
one of the problems we have is people wait for an authoritative figure to tell them how things are, and then we all fight about it. And and uh, we need to kind of back off the fighting and arguing, and it's okay to hold the space for contradictory information and contrast together while we try to figure out what the truth is. So we need to be a lot more tolerant of wherever someone's coming from and their human experience. Um, and to share with each other and just let's have the conversation because we're way overdue. And I'll give you to Brett. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, I, I, I would hi. just like to say that that, that um, um, all of these people that have participated in NASA and, and the space program have their human experience. You know, that there there's a very rich human experience there that, that – really would correct the history if it was allowed to come out and some of it is thank goodness you know and there there's um there there are so many um people and and organizations that have, we've been uh, we've made the bad guy you know and it's to my understanding you know that there are definitely secret societies you know um, and and there's there's different factions of them, and they 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 all believe in balance and all that. But some have participated in the lower, you know, realms of consciousness and so on, and 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 moved up forward until it ran out. And we're at a time when it ran out, and then the bearers of these some of these secrets, you know, that that are very ancient and from space and from the moon and Mars and that. They, they've been the bearers of these secrets for centuries, you know, and um, a, a lot of these secret societies are coming out with this information because that is in the in, in the sense of balance in the universe, you know. So that that that's one way that they look at it, you know. Um, that's my understanding that that some you know the the ones that have enjoyed the lower realms of consciousness, you know, and um, uh, dimensionality um, have have focused on some of the the darker things in our society, you know, and and that doesn't need to be that that way anymore, you know. It just it, it just doesn't. Right. There there needs to be some kind of accountability and some balance, and and that that was the purpose all along for keeping these secrets, you know, is, is to um, create the balance at that particular time period or on that particular timeline. So, you know, that that's one thing that I would like to say, you know, as far as like a closing thing. Well, and how do we reach you and Karen? Oh my gosh, you can yeah, you, you can reach your, us on uh, just right? Yes, you 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 can reach us on Facebook on on Lars um Lunar Anomaly Research Society on Facebook and and also um you, you can reach us um at you know, Brett Collin at gmail dot com and yeah <laughs> you you can reach us there. Okay. Whatever you want to share. It's all it's great. Okay, well thank you so much, Karen and Brett for oh. coming on and sharing and uh we'll plan another show and bring in on Ken Johnson, Doctor Johnson, somewhere in the near future. You're okay. welcome. Thank you, John um, and Janet and Sasha and everybody at the station. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk to you very soon. Thank you, John. Thank you. Final words. Thank um, you for coming. You said, you, you said Dr. Johnston. I was just looking online. He's got a, a Ph.D. in metaphysics. Um, yeah. As I'm an ordained minister, I'm a I'm a metaphysical minister, so I found a, a great appreciation in that, you know, which means he's not just a scientist, but he's all about consciousness and consciousness studies, which just shows how deep his body, mind, and spirit run. Um, another point of interest I found interesting is that the Apollo missions, well, Apollo was a god that was known by the Italians, the Romans more specifically, and the Greeks. Both called him Apollo, and to me, he was an extraterrestrial god. So NASA named the Apollo missions, of course, the first ones to go to the moon, at least through what the you know the public eye gets to see. They named him after an alien, which I kind of thought was interesting. Yay! <laughs> and then 
Great observation. On another, well, I just I don't know how <laughs> and, to. And do you that know? Um, we haven't been able. I uh, maybe Doctor Lesson has. We were trying to figure out which, uh, you know, the gods are the Anunnaki, and at different time periods they are called different names, like Apollo. But if you go back in time, you know, he probably had another name. I'll have to ask Doctor Lesson who is Apollo. He's probably somebody's uh, son, Anki or Enlil's son, or could be Anki or Enlil, just another manifestation. Okay, back to you. I, I stole your ball. Go ahead. <laughs> say what you No, want but to say. It, it's a good it's a good point that you bring up because it's interesting that Zeus in Greek mythology was known as Jupiter in Roman mythology. And mm-hmm. Hades Hades in Greek mythology was known as uh Pluto in Roman mythology. And Poseidon in Greek mythology was known as Neptune in Roman mythology, but Apollo was known as Apollo in both. So I thought that was a uh, an important point of interest to bring up. But um also uh Dr. Johnston spoke of his uh early UFO contact experiences as an experiencer and he was told by ET that he was going to be an ambassador between humans and the ETs. And then to further that thought, um, he received information, however he did, that the Watchers, which to me are the fallen angels, the Anunnaki, um, that they keep tabs on us, and they always have, and they do to this day, and they perhaps always will. And then um, Apollo astronauts were told not to return by E.T. when they went and investigated one of the craters. And right after that, NASA scrapped the Apollo missions, at least in the public eye. And then uh, Dr. David Livingston had spoken of moon astronauts had their memories blanked or altered by our government so they couldn't actually recollect the whole story of what they even did and what they encountered which I thought was very interesting. So those were some points I wanted to bring up about Dr. Ken Johnston uh, before we wrapped up the show. And uh, the way to get in touch with me is uh, through a website that Ken did for me. She's done all of my media for me. Speaking of media, it's johnpolkmedia.com. It's the best way to get in touch with me. And uh, Karen and, uh, and Brett, Brett did the cover, but Karen was the editor of my book, Yahweh, the Biblical God, is an Alien. And a year removed, I realized that Yahweh was, in fact, Enlil from the Anunnaki. So those are my closing thoughts. Right. That's our understanding. Yeah, I thought we had a a brilliant show. And I do look forward to actually throwing some questions at Dr. Ken Johnston, hopefully here, you know, within the next month or so. That would be great. Well, we'll be working. We don't, unfortunately, we don't have it. Oh yes, I'm gonna have. Oh, let me let me just real, get real quick. I did book next Friday's show. Who did I get? Oh, experiencer and uh, psychotherapist Laurie McDonald. I was uh, with her this weekend at the um, oh, UFO Con the 2015 the Experiencer event. And so she's going to be on Friday the 6th with myself and and John. And we're going to interview Laurie McDonald. So that's that's your homework there, John. I know you're really good at research. Oh, and good. And tomorrow, uh, the 1st. No, not, no, not tomorrow. Tomorrow's, the, tomorrow's Halloween. So make sure you get out there and scare somebody. But Sunday, we have Jennifer Stein. And do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about Jennifer? You met her at a conference. I'm going to keep one eye on the time here. Okay, we have some time. I did. Um, Um, You recommended Jennifer to me, but I actually knew her, but uh, it's good to hear from a fresh person. What impressed you about Jennifer Stein and that you referred her to Aquarian Radio Network and now interviewing her? Well, what was um, really cool for me is that I got to sit right next to her at the Experience or Speak conference on August 29th, which was the day that the visitors came and visited us. And um, rumor has it that Travis Walton, um, let me me take a step backwards. Jennifer Stein, for lack of a better term, 
is his media slash PR representative in the field. And um, he's so busy that he needs somebody to help him organize all the conferences and emails and media packages, et cetera. And um, I have a really nice Mac. Her Mac was twice as big as mine. And uh, you can tell she's totally organized and that um, Travis, I'm sure he loves her as a person, but he needs her help. And that's her strength. You can tell just by talking to her, she's incredibly regimented in the way that she does things. She's very organized. And it's necessary to be able to, you know, have Travis organized with all these different people and interests coming at him. Everybody wants him on their show and at their conference and everything. And then um, so she'll be interviewed Sunday and um, immediately following that, she's going to Arizona and they're going to be doing a big conference uh, showcasing the 40 year anniversary of the 1985 abduction of Travis Walton, which is a world famous case. It's one of the most famous in world history. And I had the, you know, the privilege of sitting next to her and she's very nice and personable. And I asked her if she wanted to be on Aquarian radio and she knew you and Dr. Sasha Lesson, your husband, and was excited. And then uh, when I came home, I was trying to get her on the schedule and she's like, well, I'm booked this day and I'm booked this day and booked this. She was just booked so much. (laughs) I couldn't get her on. I couldn't get her on the schedule. And uh, actually on Sunday, she's going to be busy for like five or six hours doing something else before she even does the show with you in Russia. So incredibly busy woman, um, but an astute professional and uh, just a nice person. And she's incredibly intelligent and I'm positive it'll be a great interview. (laughs) So we're going to have fun with Jennifer and we will get her on the uh, Aquarian radio show. This is uh, an episode of the Sacred Matrix of Revolution Radio with Dr. Sasha and myself. We met Jennifer Stein, oh my goodness, probably in the late 90s. Yeah, around 90, really? 98, 99. Wow, mm-hmm. she's a Sitchinite. We met her, really? I'm not even sure where it was. Uh, oh, I knew was, that. Uh, yeah. Santa Fe, New Mexico, at the very first. The um, Zach Rice Hitchin certification program that was sponsored by the Prophets Conference. And Jennifer was uh, making films back then. And so, a couple years ago, at the International UFO Congress, she had a tribute to Zach Rice Hitchin as one of the submissions to the Congress. And it was very delightful to see, especially because there was my wonderful husband, you know, 10, 15 years ago. He looked very very young, and he was brand new, pretty new to the Sitchin <laughs> material, but he didn't stop, and now he knows so much more, and um, so I'm hoping that uh, somehow in the near future we create some kind of uh, Anunnaki conference, because uh, the Anunnaki are our fathers and mothers, and we are genetically very close to the Anunnaki. They are the ones that created this hybrid program with humans and Anunnaki, or the humanoids, uh, Homo uh, sapiens, Homo erectus, to create Homo sapiens. There we go. Say it right, Janet. Say it right. (laughs) Anyway, I'm putting up a page for the show coming up with Jennifer Stein. I'll probably get that up by the end of the day. And so that is Sunday's program. And so we are always looking for talent to come on our shows to talk about your books. This is in the paranormal extraterrestrial UFO field, which is huge, by the way. And it's growing exponentially. It's a field that is just um, taking over, and UFOs are real, and people are starting to realize that and recognize that, and that's what's going to create the shift that we were talking about earlier in the show. Oh, I have it right here. This is called uh, the conference is skyfiresummit.com. Skyfiresummit.com. So you can get that information. And do check out John Pope. I'm looking at the site. Very nice site. To peruse that a little bit more. And our main websites for Janet and Dr. Sasha Lesson are aquarianradio.com. We have Peace. Speaks.com, that's spelled E-N-K-I, 
S P E A K S dot com. We have extraterrestrial contact dot com. Yeah, extraterrestrial contact dot com. Search work dot com. And these link to several other websites. I have a Janet uh, Lesson dot com. We like to make websites <laughs> and do radio shows. So if you want to contact us about being on one of our future shows, write to us at Aquarian Radio at gmail dot com. And that's spelled A Q U A R I A N Radio R A D I O at Gmail dot com. And I think that's about it for today. I want to thank everybody for joining us for another incredible episode of radio. And much love and blessings and aloha. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Have you heard? Metro by T-Mobile now includes Amazon Prime. Yes, enjoy the best of shopping and entertainment, movies, TV shows, music, free shipping, and much more. All included for just $40 per line for three lines. All on the T-Mobile network. Discover the smarter way. Metro by T-Mobile. That's genius. One offer per account. Offer subject to change. Twelve ninety nine per month value. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Metro customers may notice reduced speeds versus some T-Mobile customers. Video at 480p. Capable device required. See store for details and terms and conditions.